Hello to all and a warm welcome on The Watchers TV and today I am very delighted to share with you one of our walkthrough videos. This time we'll be visiting the new Audemars Piguet Museum set in Le Brassu in the beautiful Valley de Joux, home of complicated watchmaking. This new setup actually regroups uh, things that previously existed, obviously some uh, new ones, but the layout is totally different and so is the experience of going through it. Part of it now found in a gorgeous spiral looking structure designed by Danish superstar architect Bjorn Ingels and you can definitely feel the link uh, between the heritage of the brand and its future. Restoration department still found in the historic building then a time capsule voyage in the history of AP, including some of its most iconic, precious and relevant timepieces, but also the presence of its super complication watch department. So let's go for the visit, but I just wanted to point out that we won't show you all that can be seen. You still have to come and discover this by yourself, but you can also trust us to show you a few things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see were you to come. Yes, we have our little privileges, but the important part is being able to share them with you. Enjoy. So thanks for having us here. Uh, I had the privilege of coming to the previous museum and here we are in this absolutely stunning and gorgeous place. Can you explain to us a little bit the, the, the concept behind this uh, new building? It's tying it back to tradition at all times in the most meaningful of ways. And this is why the museum is entirely bathed in light and why you're constantly looking at the Valley des Joux no matter where you are in the space. This is putting the visitor in the mindset of the watchmaker, shortening that distance between the watch on your wrist and the men and women that create it. The museum gives us that simultaneous past, past present, future experience in doing so because you're looking out at the same views that Jules Audemars and Edward Piguet looked out and that the watchmakers today look at. You're bathed in the same light that they work in. That's a critical aspect of this whole experience it isn't just the objects, it's the cultural context and the empathy of the men and women who create these objects. The idea that Sebastian and I had was could we create an exhibition, could we create this story where a watch expert can come in with somebody new to this field with the same tour guide and each come out with a meaningful experience that touches them simultaneously. We love watch and clock museums, but we also love art and design and culture and all kinds of other fields and disciplines. We wanted this space to have that feeling, to have that texture, and to be memorable for everybody, everybody in the family coming. That was a real critical element and approach, but really that empathy to the men and women creating the watches, and that's very much at the heart of the exhibition as well, which we'll take a closer look at, I'm sure. Let's go for a walk. Less than 10 families sat and stood in the Valley de Joux during centuries and kind of married each other and created a network that was uh, really uh, probably the reason why they could develop these complications. Absolutely. Sharing secrets and uh, marrying each other to get the secrets of the neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even going like we do today, going out of the valley to learn new information and Absolutely. bring it back in. Uh, I remember you taught me Jules Audemars uncle, great uncle, Louis Audemars, yes. had eight children yes. who were all sent to different watchmakers to learn different techniques exactly. to bring it back into the family, um, which is just was such a great insight. This watch is extremely special for, for, for many reasons. Uh, the first one I would say is that it's the oldest known watch uh, from the Valley de Joux that is signed. We have looked in every museum, everywhere, for a watch signed in the 18th century by a watchmaker from the Valley de Joux. Nothing. And this one was. Why? We asked. It's signed Joseph Piguet. The reason is very simple. It is still owned by the grand, 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 grandson of uh, <laughs> the watchmaker who made it. So it was not made to be sold, it was made to be kept in the family. And we have the register. We see that uh, Joseph Piguet is accepted in 1769. So we consider, based on that, that this is his masterpiece. He had to flex. He had to prove his worth to be entered into that exclusive club. And exactly as Sebastian said, when you put the data together, it all falls into place. This is also paying a respect and paying tribute to the watchmakers before and at the time of the foundation of AP. Mm -hmm. 
We, we don't pretend AP was the creator of watchmaking in the Valais de Joux or in Switzerland. We just pay tribute to the people who made it possible to happen. And Jules, uh, Jules, uh, Jules Louis Audemars and Edouard Auguste Piguet were part of this network. Ecosystem. They were members of this ecosystem. So after discovering parts of what makes the Valais de Joux so special, the links between families, uh, this focus from the start on uh, complicated watchmaking, well, uh, we'll now go in another pedagogical uh, section of the museum with the goal of making you understand in a rather fun and uh, pleasant way how a timepiece actually works. And to exemplify this, well, Audemars Piguet mandated the famous Swiss automaton specialist, Monsieur François Junot, to develop a mechanical allegory showing you the three distinct parts of any movement. The required the stored energy, the gear trains and associated uh, indication of time passing by, here represented by this uh, walker on his quest for fresh mushrooms, and finally how the energy is liberated uh, regularly to achieve this precisely, steadily and repeatedly. But then we get to see a large mock-up uh, example of proper watchmaking regulating organs including the tourbillon or the double balance wheel. And compared to the minute size of these components found in, in your watch, well, here you'll definitely get a better understanding of how they operate. Okay, so let's now move on to the center part of the exhibition. This is where we talk about the complications. This is the heart of Audemars Piguet. The 19th century, 75% of the watches made by AP were complicated watches and 50% were repeaters. A lot of this project was simultaneously worked on while Sebastian and I were writing the historical complications book for Odomar Piguet, which was about our 20th century complicated wristwatches. So it was fortunate because we were doing the research and the writing and the study at the same time we were working on the curation of this exhibition as well. So it was really able for us to bring that new knowledge and to tie it here into the exhibitions and the storytelling. And we knew right away we wanted to see a historic repeater from the 1920s wristwatch right nearby one from the 1990s and early 2000s. We wanted to show this continuity in a very real way and it's very much part of the narrative when the visitors come through. They're able to have that sense of continuity. During this, uh, this process there was something else happening. The universal, oh, the yeah, most the complicated uh, pocket watch oh, yeah. we made was under restoration and was not yet owned by AP. That's right. That was a very long process. And it, it took time, it took four years, to the best watchmakers of the company to restore and to make this masterpiece functional again. It was made in 1899. Exactly. The Blanc by Louis Elise Piguet. Yes. So the etablissage system is kind of very well represented in this watch. And the movement was finished by AP and sold to Un Union Glacute. And Union Glacute cased it and changed the chronograph. The chronograph, which is one of the most complex in the world, did not work. Ah. So it was transformed by Union Glacute. Well, you know, and, and, and what we're looking at here is a different category. This goes beyond the grand complication. They're referred to often as ultra or super complicated watches. The most famous one is, of course, the grave super complication. And like this watch, it's that one assigned Patek Philippe. They were absolutely the ones overseeing. But it was also, like this, a watch that required many different talents and know-hows to put together. This watch predates that by couple decades. But the key takeaway here is back to what we spoke about earlier. In 1899, when this was created, this was at the apex of science and technology and what was capable, what people were able to do. But in terms of mechanical technologies and complications and functions, there was no object like this before, yet many did follow afterwards. It's that you had these very creative, talented people in an unexpected geography pooling together their collective talent to create things that were entirely new and unexpected, building on previous knowledge, but also introducing entirely new approaches. Inter interestingly, at Audemars Piguet, there was also that sort of startup aspect of Jules and Edward themselves and what they sought to create in the creation of a truly independent company whose destiny would remain here in the Valley des Joux. Everything's unique before 1951. So then you have similar watches, and then it was a determination of analysis. And that's where friends 
Francisco and our late colleague, the great Angelo Manzoni, uh, uh, Sebastian, myself, the whole heritage team, that's when we started to really analyze the watches based on condition. And we wanted the pieces here to be the best examples in terms of originality and in terms of scholarship, in terms of clarity of archives. That ultimately helped dictate some of the choices that were, we were making. You can have three beautiful calendar watches from the same decade. The one that's gonna be here on exhibition is gonna be the one with the preserved dial, unrestored ideally, or if it's restored, done with absolute historic sensitivity. That was a big, big job, especially for the restoration workshop. Okay. Next immersive section. What we wanted to do in these sections is look at each time period of Audemars Piguet watchmaking, but contextualize it with the architecture of the time, the fashion of the time, the transportation of the time, the textures, the feel, as well as who in the company was driving it, which member of the Audemars and Piguet families were moving things forward. So these clusters really take it, that notion of cultural dialogue and amplifies it in a way that we hadn't ever seen before in a watch museum. And that's something Sebastian and I really were committed to taking place. This falls into that idea where you don't have to be an expert of watchmaking to understand what's going on here in these clusters. You can look at the pieces, look at the context, and everything starts to fall into place. Well, this watch was made by AP based on the Etablissage system, so many other people and, and, and small workshops here, and sold to Don and Son, a British watchmaker in London, and London was the center of the world at the time, and from London they could get access to the royalties and, uh, and all the, the, the important personalities of the world. So this is the way it happened, connection between local and, and international. You're looking at the only known hunter case double-sided enamel repeater that uh, we have in the collection. We're yet to discover a second one. The archives could be very specific, but it won't always be so specific on an enamel decoration if it was in the front or in the back. So the one over here was quite a discovery and it also speaks to your notion of time because this would have been an absolute labor of love and various different expertises required to create that piece. Here depicting a couple scenes from Napoleon's story, um, and it's an absolutely fascinating duo of watches speaking to very culturally specific, but in two very, very different ways, approaching that global, that global sense that Audemars Piguet was already instilling very, very early on in the company. We acquired that not that long ago, just a couple years ago at auction, and uh, I had to go a little over budget there. He was, <laughs> he was, he was sweating a little bit, yeah. Michael! Yeah, but it was, you know, we couldn't let it go, and I said to Sebastian, you know what, we'll, we, if we need to explain to the board, they're going to understand. But nobody challenged it or questioned it. They got it. This was, this was as he said, the first time we're seeing a double-sided enamel repeater with this fascinating, fascinating international story bringing France, Prussia, Germany, Switzerland all into one scope. That's Audemars Piguet. I mean, that was why it had to be part of this collection and needed to be shared with everybody. Let's continue our walk. This is one of my favorite uh, showcases. It's so well balanced. Each watch is a masterpiece of elegance and technicity. And it shows that design actually really started with Art Deco, with wrist watches. Before, the pocket watches were all round and rarely signed. So yes, the design of the movement was different from one watchmaker to the other one. But the case was not really uh, meaningful. Here we see uh, a cushion shape, we see a rectangle around, we see the work on the lugs, on the, on the tonneau shape. Everything is so finely made. And you're looking at one of the earliest known skeletonized wristwatches, not just from Audemars Piguet, but industry-wide, one of the earliest known. You're looking at one of only 35-minute repeaters created by Audemars Piguet in the vintage era. Quite interesting, Mark, one topic of study that Sebastian and I were able to demonstrate and prove, it's published in the Complications book, was the close link between women's pendant minute repeaters and the birth of the minute repeating wristwatch, something that I'd theorized for a long time. We were able to prove it together that the minute repeating wristwatch was a direct evolution of the woman's pendant watch. The miniaturization had been mastered, it had been accomplished, and then boom, 
alone. Of those 35, six of those movements were recased pendant watches into wristwatches. So a lot of great stories, again, not just about Audemars Piguet, but about the industry, mm -hmm. were able to look at through something like this. Early jump hour watches, which still remain popular today. We're looking at one from 1930, created just after the Depression. Over here is a watch that you've documented that's very well documented, the 5516, which was Audemars Piguet, it's uh, first perpetual calendar and the wristwatch and the world's first perpetual calendar wristwatch with leap year indication. This one is from the second series of watches produced in 1957, but it's not the watch I specifically want to talk about. I want you to take a particular note of the finishing. Here you can see a balance of mirror and satin finishing. Um, Sebastian and I have documented that we start to see this quite consistently in the 1910s. Those finishing techniques had been done on movements, but when the pocket watch evolved to the wrist watch, some of those techniques of the hand finishing were then applied to the cases. And this is that notion you like to hear Audemars Piguet talk about, that play of light. It's really understood and recognized through the lens of the Royal Oak, and that watch absolutely amplified that play of light and that combination of satin and mirror finishing, Genta was an absolute genius to approach it in such a way. However, the techniques themselves had been in the company for over half a century prior. So as original and as iconic as the Royal Oak is, the elements that comprise it had already very much been part of the culture of hand finishing at Audemars Piguet. Another thing a lot of people don't realize with Genta was he was primarily a designer of women's watches for some of his career, at least with Audemars Piguet. Many of the creations that are we celebrate here in the museum are women's watches he created in the 1960s. And what makes the Royal Oak work so well was that he applied those approaches to women's watches into this watch in terms of the feel the ergonomics, the texture, and the finishing. We associate Royal Oak as, as a, a masculine design, but secretly underneath, there's feminine design codes throughout. You hear how people talk about it. Hey, look how it catches the light. They could be speaking about a gemstone or a diamond or the descending links, the art deco aesthetics, the combination of finishing techniques. What makes that watch so successful was that, that he, he, Gerald Genta, had such experience with women's watches and creating watches that not just look beautiful, but feel great on the wrist. Genta designed the icon. He designed the one, but every other Royal Oak after, really through the 70s, into the mid 80s, Jacqueline Dimier was the principal designer behind those watches. So she was the one who created the women's versions in 76, the white gold, two tone, yellow gold in 77, the complications in 84, the first perpetual. So it's Genta's, of course, the key, the element uh, of that story. But Jacqueline Dimier also deserves an immense amount of respect for the way she was able to expand that original design into creations which are still celebrated today. All right, let's continue with again some kind of interactive part of the museum where you'll be able to test a few things by yourself, grasp even more the complexity of a watch movement, but also where you will find the prestigious super complication uh, department of the brand. It was critical for us to demonstrate, I guess Sebastian mentioned earlier, that transmission of knowledge but through the highest expertise and the most important watches we produce. We wanted to filter that message specifically through the Grand Complication Workshop. At Audemars Piguet, the Grand Complication is defined as needing to have minute repeater, split second chronograph, and perpetual calendar all together. That's our definition as it was established historically by the company, and it remains so. So we have six watchmakers. They're creating unique watches one at a time, 648 components, they're individual works. The watchmaker is tied to those works for as long as they're here with the company, essentially managing the future of those watches as long as they're here, if there's ever servicing or repair that's needed. So we really wanted to bring that workshop, not a simulation, not an element of it, but the complete actual workshop here into this space to bring that proximity on one side to the historic watches and on the other side to the valley and to the light. So these watchmakers are also creating unique grand complications. So we're echoing the grand 
band comps, but we're also echoing the fact that everything was unique until 1951. So these works are done one at a time, customer involvement, different form language, different materials, different movement finishings, a whole wide range of customization, which is looking to watches in the future, but honoring those finishing techniques and the approach of the past. But who says operational department? Well, this implies that you will find uh, behind the scenes special rooms with some of the machines needed for the team of watchmakers to manufacture and adjust some parts and components needed uh, for the realization of their timepieces. Obviously something you won't be able to see here on your visit. All right, and now for big uh, Royal Oak aficionados, well, when these monoliths come to life, well, you will probably see the most complete and dense collection of the iconic timepiece, a real alley dedicated to the famous model. Here you have a collection of 89 Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore and Royal Oak Concept in uh, showcases that weight 950 kilos each and that display in a very transparent manner the history of all these three collections, starting with the Royal Oak Jumbo and its various uh, uh, interpretations from 1972 up to the 21st century. We have never shown that. All the variations of 39 millimeter ultra thin self-winding rail oaks. Here it is and it starts this incredible collection. You'll even see watches that are still in production and watches, as soon as watches is discontinued, it officially becomes the province of the Audemars Piguet Museum. So that heritage isn't separate from what we do. It's so central to what we do. And, and it's really exciting because this last two points in the Grand Complication Workshop and this exhibition is the continuing opportunity for Sebastian and I to work together, even though I'm working on new products, he's representing the history. This exhibition and the Grand Comp Workshop literally bring it back together. Because as soon as a concept is discontinued and it's no longer being sold, the prototype comes over here where it just gets curated and the story is told. But we also have a few models that are in active production as well. Because how cool is it to be at a museum and to see an object that you also have. You know, this is a rare experience when we go to the Louvre, when we go to the Met, the Hermitage, the British Museum. It's not so often we own something that's on exhibition. We wanted to again create that personal connection that people can have. Hey, wait, I have that watch in my collection. Oh, how cool. That real intimacy that happens. And we knew we wanted to end here in this spiral with those three chapters, 72 Royal Oak, 1993 offshore, 2002 concept in order. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into the uh, historical parts yes. of uh, this uh, fantastic uh, space. And this but is where I have to leave you guys. Yes, Michael has to leave us, but I think uh, I'm in pretty good hands. You're in uh, the best of hands to <laughs> see the historic building. I wish I could continue on, but I'm back over to the new watches. All right. I'm jumping over there to uh, get back to what we're creating for tomorrow. So gentlemen. The circle. Yes, absolutely. Okay, before getting access to some uh, rather privileged places, I uh, just wanted to show you something else where you normally start the visit and where you get a better understanding of what has been done with the construction of this new place, how carefully the historic part has been uh, restored, how top quality materials have been uh, used, and simply demonstrating that uh, no corners have been cut. They went all the way and you do get this feeling when going through it. But there's nothing pretentious or, or in your face. It just has been done very properly with some good thinking and more importantly with some good taste. So let's now go and visit the actual restoration department of AP which worked on most of the timepieces seen in the main exhibition hall. Something also usually closed for the visit but well, you know, you know us. We are in the restoration workshop, a very, very important place uh, where four highly talented watchmakers uh, preserve the know-how, the old know-how, but also the old watches from the Heritage Collection, but also from our clients. And one of these masters is Francisco, Francisco Passandin. Alors, bienvenue à l'atelier de restauration. Donc, on a la chance, en tant qu'horloger, de, de, voilà, de respirer euh, le, les origines d'eau de Marpiguet, euh, puisque c'est ici que tout a commencé. Et on a cette chance-là, avec les, les quatre horlogers euh, qu'on est, dans cette pièce, et dans tout l'étage, c'est là où on a commencé à fabriquer les premières montres euh, eau de Marpiguet, euh, des simples et des compliquées. 
Et là, bah, nous, on a cette chance-là, qui est le rêve de tout horloger, de pouvoir prendre toutes ces, ces, ces pièces qui nous arrivent un petit peu de, de, du monde entier et on va jusqu'à faire les mêmes gestes que M. Audemars et Piguet en, en utilisant des outils que vous avez autour de vous. Et ces outils, euh, ben voilà, on a dû apprendre à travailler, les restaurer a dû apprendre à travailler avec ces outils pour réaliser des pièces entièrement à la main. Donc on va jusqu'à faire des, des croquis entièrement à la main, qui, qui, comme, comme ils travaillaient à l'époque, donc ils faisaient des croquis euh, pour réaliser les, les, les pièces entièrement à la main. Si je prends par exemple euh, un, un timbre de sonnerie, donc on part dans la matière, on donne forme, on donne forme à ce... À, à, à ce timbre, donc de cette forme, je vais sortir deux fils s'il y a deux notes, trois si on a trois, et voilà, ces deux fils, je vais les, ces deux fils, je vais les souder à une partie que j'aurai scié au boc fil, percé, façonné, et voilà la pièce juste avant le choc thermique qu'elle a trempé le revenu. Il faut combien de temps pour faire ça euh, une, petite, une petite semaine, petite, 40, un peu moins d'une semaine de travail. Et voilà, on va jusqu'à l'accordage. Peut-être euh, euh, une fois euh, la trempe est revenue fait, on va jusqu'à l'accordage. Euh, voilà, euh, on coupe un des fils pour obtenir la note haute. Et là, c'est déjà fait. Et on a, on a déjà les deux notes. Ensuite, après, on va aller plus loin. On va donner une vibration à chaque fil la plus longue possible. Et pour ça, on lime, on écoute, on lime, on écoute et on mesure pour obtenir ce résultat. Hein Miracle. <rire> Et on obtient ce résultat, si on a bien travaillé, évidemment. Vous entendez la différence Avec des vibrations beaucoup plus longues à chaque fil. Et après, il y, y a la beauté. Donc, euh, la finition, on va jusqu'à utiliser la gentiane, qui est une plante qui, qui pousse chez nous. Là, elles sont en train de sécher à ce moment-là. Et du coup, on va les cueillir et puis on utilise de la pâte de diamant pour polir toutes les parties arrondies euh, et euh, donc pour lui donner cette beauté supplémentaire euh, qu'on a dans toutes les montres et dans, dans, toutes ces, 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 dans tous ces chefs-d'œuvre de façon à rajouter une petite touche. De la... Donc chaque montre est unique parce que chaque horloger travaille différemment. Et c'est ça qui est beau, est cette, cette beauté qu'on donne. Il peut y avoir des angles beaucoup plus prononcés d'un horloger à l'autre. Et c'est ça qui fait le charme d'un autre métier. Et de, de, de travailler sur une pièce comme, comme l'Universel, qui est... Voilà, c est, c est une... Alors là, c'est voilà, euh, l'apothéose, euh, si on peut dire, un, pour un horloger. Il faut déjà avoir la chance de pouvoir travailler là-dedans. Mais c'est sûr qu'on peut passer euh, du cauchemar au bonheur. <rire> et parfois, ben, on a envie de la balancer par la fenêtre. <rire> <rire> tellement nous cause. On trouve souvent des solutions en dehors du travail, quand je vais faire mes footings dans la nature et que voilà, j'ai fait une journée assez, euh, euh, assez difficile avec quelle que soit la pièce, mais surtout l'universel. Et, et du coup, j'ai dit, comment est-ce qu'il faut que j'ajuste je, je, ce ressort ou cette pièce qui me cause des, des soucis ben, Je vais courir dans la nature et puis du coup, euh, le lendemain, J'essaye tout ce que j'ai trouvé en faisant mon footing. Et c'est ça. On, donc, on fait parfois des heures supplémentaires. Mais voilà, pour se faire plaisir. Et c'est sûr que quand on arrive au bout d'une pièce pareille, euh, on se dit, mais quelle chance j'ai eu de pouvoir toucher. Parce qu'il y, y a peu d'horlogers qui ont cette chance qu'on qu a eue avec Angelo, puisqu'on l'a restauré tous les deux. Et voilà, au bout du camp, c'est du bonheur. Ça vous a pris combien de temps 500 heures, euh, voilà. On a fait un devis de 300 heures. Et puis après, on a dépassé largement le devis. Mais voilà, c'est parce qu'il y a toujours, sur une pièce comme ça, il y a toujours des, des petites retouches. Euh, parfois, on... je pense qu'à nous deux, on l'a démonté chaque an, trois, quatre fois. <rire> Sébastien venait de temps en temps. Elle fonctionne, l'universel euh, on a dû démonter quelques, quelques pièces pour euh, retoucher tel et tel, euh, tel et tel ressort. Et puis voilà, on recommençait. Quand on arrive dans, ce, dans, une, com de, de, dans une complication pareille, c'est qu'il y a des différentes couches et chaque couche doit se respecter. L'équilibre de force de tous les ressorts, euh, c'est sûr que voilà, 
c'est du compliqué. Et on se complique. <rire> Tout en, en allant jusqu'au bout de la restauration. Mais c'est sûr que c'est une fierté quand même personnelle que, quand on, on se lance dans des, dans des aventures pareilles. <rire> Et pour l'universel, euh, j'ai fait une marche à suivre avec même des vidéos d'environ de 80 pages. C'est quand même important de penser à l'avenir, ouais. penser aux jeunes, qu'ils aient plus de facilité que nous. Ouais. Parce que euh, moi, quand je me suis lancé dans l'universel, euh, les yeux fermés, donc il euh, n'y a aucun croquis, il n'y a aucune documentation. Et euh, donc en pensant aux jeunes, j'ai pensé à faire des photos, des petites vidéos de chaque partie, euh, de chaque couche, de façon à ce qu'eux, ils aient plus de facilité si un jour ils vont... Euh, la démonter, euh, ben voilà, ils ont peut-être euh, peut pensé à moi. Dit. Même pour une grande complication, on fait des marches à suivre de façon à ce que les horlogers puissent s'appuyer là-dessus et qu'ils gagnent du temps. Well, that was quite something. And after leaving the, the inspiring people of this restoration department, now it was time to see another slightly special archive room as well as live in the flesh some of these incredible historical timepieces. Again, something not always on the menu when you come and visit AP. So Sebastian, explain us where we are here. So we are here in the Registers Room. It's a very important place because this is where we keep all the historical registers covering the whole production of AP from 1875. Actually, 1882, because we still look for the first register. <laughs> Let's have a look. So, I told you Audemars Piguet was a small company. It was, in fact, because the first 100 years production covers that. And then it expanded. And until today, we have someone writing by hand every single watch that is produced and delivered. So if we take the very first register, the oldest we have, first page, 13 watches, out of which all are complications, mm -hmm. and nine are minute repeaters. It really shows where we are from. And a few clients. Here, for example, we have the first page, Vacheron Constantin. Michael told you, this was a network. Mm -hmm. And this register covers 25 years. The whole production of AP during 25 years is here. Is it this book? Yes, so small production. This is a place where we also have time and the silence needed to hear repeaters. That's a repeater from 19, uh, 1895. It's always an emotion to hear that. To think that 130 years ago, craftsmen have been able to produce this object of beauty in terms of sound, in terms of uh, decoration, but also precision. This is a bit more recent, Art Deco style, complete calendar, jumping hour, in platinum. This one was made in 1912. The size is amazing. This is a minute repeater. Nine and a half lines, one of the thinnest in the world. It's very fast. It's uh, hurrying a little bit. Huh? <laughs> it's a late repeater. AP made very, very few jumping seconds in its history. All were made in the 19th century, and I did not find more than 10. We have one in the complication section, and the second one here, because we want to share, to see the beauty of this very small hand jumping. Beautifully, we cannot make it work in the museum itself. These objects are too delicate and too precious. That would be a dream to, to show that to everybody. <laughs> a 
and a few other examples that I took that we like to share with our guests. Uh, a coin watch and an ultra thin piece from the 1970s. So the whole industry was in very big trouble. In 10 years, two thirds of the employment in, in Swiss watchmaking disappeared. And meanwhile, in parallel uh, with the ray look and the perpetual calendar, ultra thin from 1978, AP continued to produce ultra thin open work watches. It's a unique piece again. You can teach watchmaking with this watch. Everything is visible. All the material that could be removed to see the inside of the movement has been removed. The coin watch from the late 1990s, after 100 years of tradition building coin watches, this is one of the latest that was made with an open work movement. AP is known for rail oak, but has a very long history and very creative in the field of ladies' watches. This contains the smallest mechanism in the world in 1927. There was a competition between uh, neighbors, you know, yes. Jäger Le Coultre, Audemars Piguet. So who would be the thinnest, who would be the smallest? So in 1927, AP came with this incredibly small movement. Two years later, Calibre 101 was created by Le Coultre and Company. And AP decided that Okay, <laughs> we leave that was it. Yeah, exactly. We <laughs> leave them because we had the thinnest yeah. <laughs> and we kept the thinnest. <laughs> so just before finishing the visit, I really wanted to show you a very special room where some uh, lucky people will be able to enjoy private watchmaking and other craft uh, lessons. And this part is not yet fully operational, but I can already totally see myself on these benches and feeling just right in this rather inspiring environment. So, Marc-André, here we are. Well, Sebastian, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for the visit. Thank you for this walkthrough. This is an absolutely gorgeous place. Okay, I know I repeat myself a little bit, but it is. And uh, thank wait. you so much for your for coming, for your appreciation. You know, our best uh, reward is the pleasure we can share. Well, and you can bring some people also. We'll do that. Right? Everybody's welcome. All right. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye. So I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough as much as we did. Uh, the bar has been set quite high, as you could uh, witness, and you can uh, naturally all come and visit this uh, new museum. Uh, that's the entire point of this place. And the journey, I mean, is really worth it. But please remember that you can't simply drop by. You need to register for it. Everything is explained on their website. You will find uh, the link in the description box uh, below. Well, all the very best to you, uh, see you real soon, and viva watchmaking, and viva the Valley de Joux!